Once there was a pastor who told his congregation we were going to have a have funeral services for a stranger and I'd like y'all to be there to show proper respect for the dead. And so the people all showed up in the large <coughs> church building and and uh, the casket sitting up front. And he began to speak about this poor man could always see the faults in others and felt himself above them but failed to see the things in his own life that were hurting his relationships and influence. He did not properly value the spiritual advantages and opportunities that were at his fingertips but was always wondering why God didn't give him what he was wanting. He squandered opportunities to love and serve his family but then when they were gone he grieved that he had not loved and served them as he should. He wasted his resources on frivolous spending rather than laying up treasures in heaven and advancing the work of God. He lived for the moment, seeking self-fulfillment, and therefore did not leave any significant spiritual legacy or testimony to his family and friends. And rather than living in victory and leading other souls to spiritual life and victory, he never would crucify his flesh and so lived with continual cycles of temptation, sin, regret, repentance, reformation, only to go and heal again and fall again and never seem to rise up and be a pillar for the Lord. On and on the pastor went, ended up by saying he was very fearful about the man's eternal state. Many of the people by this time were weeping and grieving at the sad ending of such a person. Then they all filed by to look at this poor man's remains. They opened the casket when the people filed by and looked in the casket. What they saw was a large mirror. A reflection of themselves. In 1 Corinthians 11.23 For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In the Old Testament, there was a number of ceremonies and practices that were designated by the term most holy. This, this is most holy. Well, I wanted to know what exactly, what Hebrew word do they use when they say most holy? The word for holy is Kodesh. And when they write most holy, you know what it is? It's Kodesh, Kodesh. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, there is no ceremony more Kodesh Kodesh than the one I just read about. In the New Covenant, we have a ceremony. We call it the Lord's Supper or Communion. It is the remembrance of the broken body and shed blood <coughs> of the Lamb of God. There was nothing in the Old Testament more holy and sacred as far as a ceremony, the Day of Atonement, once a year, the priest went behind the veil into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. But what blood was that typifying? It was typifying the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. which actually would take away the sins of the world. And so there is nothing in the Old Testament that would qualify more for Kodesh Kodesh than Communion. The taking that bread and that wine or grape juice and remembering the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a seriously sacred ceremony. It directly connects our salvation and relationship with God to the covenant based on the sacrifice of the body and shedding of the blood of God's own Son. Every covenant had to be ratified with the covenant sacrifice. 
Jesus became the covenant sacrifice. He was the, the sacrificial lamb to ratify the covenant. Without that ratifying of the covenant, we could not have a relationship with God. We could not be in covenant with God. And our salvation is only within the covenant that Jesus ratified. Oh, well, I accepted Jesus. No, you didn't accept Jesus until you got in the covenant that he ratified. Right. His blood ratified a covenant. That covenant has boundaries. That covenant has laws and rules and ceremonies. Just like the old covenant did. The new covenant does as well. And we just read the most sacred ceremony of the new covenant. And there, therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. As though you were the murderer. You have desecrated the most holy, the Kodesh, Kodesh ceremony. You have desecrated it, and therefore you are guilty as though you were the murderer. He says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now listen to me. There are many out there who believe that they are following Jesus, and they do not partake at all. Here he says, if you partake unworthily, you are eating and drinking damnation. So, is it safer to not partake at all? Is it safer, more, safer just to flounder around and not be in church and not have, a, not have a biblical church and not partake of communion and not be a part of God's body, uh, the body of Christ, not be a part of God's program? Is that safer than being in God's program? Nope. Absolutely not. So, the partaking, the proper uh, reverence and observance of the Lord's Supper is a necessary part of salvation. That's right. Because if you partake unworthily, you're taking damnation. If you don't partake at all, you're, you're even farther away, right? Yep. So, the, if, you want to part, if you want eternal life and you don't want damnation... You've got to discern the Lord's body. You've got to examine yourself. You've got to get in the program. And you've got to partake of the ceremonies properly. Now, was that the same thing? Same way it was in the Old Testament? If you were a Gentile, the Day of Atonement meant nothing to you. Okay? If you were some Gentile barbarian out there, you're not, you were in God's program. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't be guilty of desecrating the ceremonies because you never had any part in it, right? So were you safer? No. No, there was no safety in not being a part of the program. And there was no safety in being in the program but partaking unworthily. If you, if you uh, partook of the ceremonies and sacrifices unworthily, read, read Isaiah chapter 1. God says, your new moons... Uh, and your ceremony, all the things that he had commanded, he said they are disgusting. They're like smoke in my nose and eyes. Vain oblations, he called them. But they were what he had said to do, but they weren't doing it the way he said to do it. So there was no safety in going through the motions. Understand, if you wanted to be, if you wanted to be in the Old Testament and be saved by the program, you had to not only partake, but you had to partake worthily. Now somehow we think that in the New Testament that is not near as important. But in reality, the Kodesh Kodesh is higher and more sacred in this ceremony than any ceremony of the Old Testament. Amen. Do we see it that way? Now it says here, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, was that because he was incapable of discerning the Lord's body? Or does that mean that he was unwilling? Or does it mean he just wasn't paying attention? Maybe he didn't care. Well, it doesn't matter why, does it? That's right. It says, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, regardless of why, 
eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not discerning the sacredness, not discerning the Kodesh Kodesh of this situation. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or are dying. For if we would judge ourselves, verse 31, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-one. 31, you got to write this down. you got to put it on your mirror in the morning. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. If you do not respond properly to this chastening, you will be condemned with the world. That's the idea here, okay? If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. This is not just a... People say, well, the preacher shouldn't get involved. It's just self-examination. Uh -huh. Obviously, if you read, the, if you read this, right. the preacher wrote it yeah. to the church. He said, examine yourself. Okay? Now, does that mean Paul could not judge or examine them? No. He was judging and examining them. Yep. He was giving them his... Uh, Prescription. He was giving them his uh, diagnosis. Uh, he was judging them because they weren't judging themselves. Let me ask you a question. As this tree here gets old, maybe it'll develop a rotten spot. Which way is it going to fall? Okay. Say this is, well, this is north and this is south. Which way is the tree going to fall, north or south? South. Why? How do you know? How do you know that in 10 years that tree is going to fall south? Leaning that way. Because it's leaning that way. And things always fall in the direction they're leaning. That's right. Yep. Right? Which way will you fall if you do fall? Which way, if you're going to fall, which way are you going to fall? The direction you're leaning. Do you know which direction you're leaning? Number one, are you capable of using the Bible, God-ordained authority, and the godly examples in your life to evaluate which way you are leaning? Can you do that? Do you have enough perception to look at the Bible, to look at what the preacher says, to look at the people in your life that you look up, at, look up to as God, as a godly person. That's a godly individual. That person is walking with God. Now, can you use those as... Uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, huh? Reference points. As reference points, can you use those things and evaluate which way you're leaning? You ought to be able to. I mean, if you're over five years old, you ought to be able to, right? Amen. What is your most vulnerable area? What is your weak spot? If you act carnal, where will it likely be? You say, well, I don't know. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. What do you think your mother would say? What do you think your father would say if you ask him that? What do you think the preacher would say if you ask him that? You say, well, I, you know, I don't know which way I'm leaning. Are you afraid to ask? Are you afraid to go to your father or mother and say, which way am I leaning? Are you afraid to go to the preacher and say, which way am I leaning? You don't have any clues? Why don't you ask yourself, what would God say? Mm -hmm. If Jesus were here, if I walked up to Jesus and said, Jesus, which way am I leaning? If I fall, which way am I going to fall? Do you think, you think that in your mind you'd know? I think so. Mm -hmm. Number two, are you capable, and that comes in with willing, to honestly evaluate your weak area and act, accurately evaluate it without softening and defending it? Are you capable of refuting your own excuses? And showing the foolishness behind them? Hmm. Are you capable of looking in the mirror and being totally honest with the person you're looking at? Are you capable of that? I think you are. If you said your excuses to your preacher, what would he say? What would your mother say? 
What would your father say? What would God say? Your excuses for why you're leaning that way. Your excuses for why those things are in your life. Your excuses for why, uh, why other people think I'm leaning that way. Why the preacher would think I'm leaning that way. Are you, are you able, are you willing to honestly look in the mirror and debunk your excuses and tell yourself, I know why you said that. I know why you used that excuse. Are you willing to do that? Number three. Once you have honestly identified and evaluated your weakness, which way you're leaning, or the leanings, plural, in your life, are you willing to discipline yourself, crucify your carnal leanings, clean up your manners, confess your faults, and fortify the wall? You see, the Bible says, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And I just told you the basic steps in judging yourself. Right. Number one, you've got to get thoroughly honest. You've got to use the Bible, your God-ordained authority, the spiritual pillars that, that God has set around you, and you've got to look at those and say, which way am I leaning? Where am I at? Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know what that means? That means that God's wrath is revealed against those who will not judge themselves, but they know, they, they know where to judge themselves. In other words, his, his wrath is revealed against those who know which way they're leaning, but they're in denial. Mm -hmm. They know which way they're leaning. They know where their weakness is. They know where their sin is. They know where their pride is. They know where their selfishness is, to some degree. And they're not willing to deal with it. They're excusing it. They're holding the truth in unrighteousness. They know better, but they're not doing better. And it says here, it goes on, that's Romans 1, 18, verse 19. Because that which may be known, well, how's it going to be known? If you're honest, you stop and think, you stop and evaluate. God gave you a good brain to use for that. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, because God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Does that mean they couldn't think of one? No. Does that mean they never tried one? No. That means in the presence of God, none of them held any weight. Right. In the presence of God, all the excuses fell flat. They are without any legitimate excuse. Because that, it says in verse 21, when they knew God, and obviously that is relative. Okay? Everybody knows different amounts and different have a higher lower understanding of God. But what they knew, yes. says when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. In other words, when they saw the light, whatever light it was in their life, when they received truth, instead of embracing it and honoring it and respecting it and following it and obeying it and submitting to it, it says they weren't thankful, but became vain in their imaginations their presumptuous thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See, God will bring knowledge to you. Mm -hmm. Every man, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Okay? All men have varying degrees of that understanding. That's right. The question is, what do you do with it? <laughs> the question is, did you, if, did you look at it? Were you honest with it? Did you, did you cover for yourself? The Bible, Jesus said, uh, men love darkness rather than light 
because their deeds are evil. So they're covering for their deeds. Mm -hmm. He says, But every man that doeth righteousness cometh to the light, that his deeds might be made manifest, that they are the work of God. They are wrought in God. When you fail to act upon light, when you have it or can get it, then you darken your mind and heart to the truth. But you are still accountable for the light you had access to. That's right. You are still accountable for that which may have been known to you. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. When I was praying for a wife as a young man, I did not want to get the wrong one. I had given my life to the Lord. I was going to be a preacher. I was going to serve God with my life. And I knew that getting the right wife was essential. Okay, so I prayed for a while when I was at Bible college. I prayed two hours every morning up, up on the hill, away from the college. God, please don't let me get the wrong one. There was a lot of young ladies there, and all the young ladies put their best foot forward. After all, they're going they're at Bible college, and there's a lot of preacher boys there, and they want to get a preacher boy. The very fact that they're there means they're all pretty good. That was, a, that was a conservative college, very conservative college. And the fact that they were even went to that college didn't go to some of these other ones meant that they, they were pretty good. But even in that, it's hard to tell which ones were there because mom and dad made them go there, which ones were there because they chose to go there. Where were they at spiritually? Well, they all, there was a dress standard. There was a dress code. So they all had to dress fairly decent. It was, I, I just didn't, I didn't want to be... Uh, you know, you, once you're once you're in it, you're in it for long for the long haul. Well, as I was praying, God gave me two principles that just he impressed on my heart. Two things that I could do to protect myself. You see, I wish I'd have had a biblical church body where I could go to my father. And I knew my father was a praying man. I knew my father was a godly man. I would know that my mother was a praying woman and a godly woman. They weren't there. My mother at that time was a praying woman, but she was not there. I was away from home. And my father at that time was not a praying man. Um, and so I thought, I said, God, you've got to be a father to me. I don't have, I, I just can't go to my pastor and so forth. In this big college situation, it was hard to ever even talk to the pastor. Huge place. He said, number one, make a list of all the important qualities from one to ten. Okay? How does she respond to authority? All right? One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, as far as character, um, you know, unselfishness, all, all, all the different qualities that were important. And to when I when I met a young lady, when I got to know her, I would rate her from one to ten. She didn't know it, but I was doing it. I was <laughs> Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't in here for just for the fun of it. I wanted to find a good wife. But the second thing I realized in, in praying about this was I had to overcome personal bias. That's very important. And with what we're talking about today, self-examination, that's your number one enemy, yep. your personal that's bias. Right. Okay? Because you're naturally going to stick up for you. You're naturally going to cover for you. You're naturally going to excuse you. But that's not proper self-examination. Because God's not going to base His evaluation on your evaluation. You understand that? Yeah. God's going to base His evaluation on what you actually really are and what you're actually really doing and why. He's not going to look at your diagnosis and your excuses and follow it. So in order for me to judge myself in such a way that he does not have to, I have to get thoroughly honest and overcome personal bias. Now, in looking for a wife, I realized that if I were a father and my son came to me and said, what do you think about this young lady? 
I would be looking at this young lady through the eyes of a father and not through the eyes of a future husband. So therefore, I would be looking at it totally different than a young man would. A young man would be looking at this girl. Oh, she's sweet. She has a nice smile. She's pretty. And I like her. But the father would say, uh, I see some character issues here that are scary, that could really cause havoc in a home. Okay? So, I realized that in order for me to overcome my personal bias, I had to step out of me and into the role of my father. And I had to look at a young lady and say, if I were a father and my son asked me about that young lady, what would I tell him? I had to also step out and realize that this young lady is going to be the mother of my daughters. That she will have a big impact. Is that what I want my daughter to be? Is that what I want my daughter to be? And is that what I want my son to marry? Well, what does that do? That overcomes personal bias. Okay? And when you are judging yourself, you have to overcome that personal bias. Let me ask you this. You know, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another. And I was just thinking yesterday, well, confess your faults one to another. Everybody knows them anyway. What, what's the scary thing, you know? Everybody else already sees them. Number one, how serious would your leaning be if you saw it in somebody else? Now, when you, I mean, you, you say, oh, well, I'm okay, I know. No, but what if you saw that same leaning in somebody else? Would it be okay? Now, number two, what counsel would you give another person who confessed to you that leaning? What steps would you recommend they take? What accountability would you recommend they have? Now let me ask you this. How serious would your leaning be if someone else was leaning in that direction the same way and it directly endangered you or your children? In other words, the leaning that you have, you saw it in somebody else, and that leaning was leaning towards your house. That tree's leaning towards your house. If it falls, it's going to smash your house. Right? Well, spiritually speaking, mm -hmm. if that person that has leanings in their life, how is that going to affect me and my children if indeed we were in direct, if, if we were directly related to that, directly in line with that? I mean, what if, what if, that person, what if I died and that was my children's godparent? Okay? That leaning is going to directly affect my children, right? Okay, that, what that does is that helps get you out of the way. Quit excusing yourself, quit covering for yourself, and look at it objectively. Mm -hmm. Would I want a person with that same leaning raising my children? I think sometimes... The greatest ability in the Christian life might be the ability to discover and properly evaluate your own weak spots, your leanings, and by self-discipline to fortify, strengthen, and eliminate the leanings that are dangerous. That's called growing in grace. Mm -hmm. But who does that anymore? I mean, we're all just kind of stuck in our rut, defending ourselves, excusing ourselves. Who is really growing? The only way you can really grow in grace is not to wait around till God kicks you in the pants and says, get up. Not to wait around till God puts you in a fire and, and makes you break. The best way to grow in grace, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Yeah. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Hopefully, the chastening will get you to do what you should have done already. But you could avoid the chastening by judging yourself, disciplining yourself, chastening yourself. You know what? Self-discipline. Self-chastening. You're not going to discipline yourself unless you chasten yourself. Unless you restrict yourself. Unless you discipline yourself. Punish yourself. You know, okay, if I do that again, I'm going to fast for a day. That might get your attention. <clears throat> what if 
if uh, what if you were the airplane pilot flying this plane and you were the one determining the flight path You could go either way. Mm -hmm. You could get into the sensual worldly. You could stay godly and biblical. Or you could veer off over here to asceticism and uh, false piety. And there's people doing this all around us. Yep. Okay? What if you were flying the plane? <clears throat> what if you were what if you became the pastor? Where is the church gonna go? Well, it all relates to this over here. Okay? Because where you're leaning affects your ability to discern truth and error. That's right. Okay? And if you're not totally honest with your own leanings, then you will lead your family and your church, if you're a bishop, you will lead them according to your leanings. Mm -hmm. And if you can't judge yourself, how are you going to judge right from wrong? What spirit would prevail in that church if you were the one flying the plane? What activities would come in? What worldliness would come in? What would the church look like in 10 years if you were in charge? What would the youth look like and act like if you were in charge? And mind you, there's a lot of people off in the ascetic false piety thinking that things are important to God that aren't important to God. Mm -hmm. Or there's those over here that are excusing human humanism. Mm -hmm. well, you know, well, you know, people have a right to do what they like, right? Mm -hmm. Where was Samson weak? Could he have seen his fall coming? He should have. Everybody else can see it coming, right? All you do is read the story of his life and you say, I know which way he's leaning. If he falls, it'll be right here. Well, could he have remedied that problem in somebody else? Could he have seen that in somebody else? He was a pretty bright fella. The moment those guys at that wedding ceremony told him his riddle, he knew exactly how they found out. He said, if you'd not plowed with my heifer, you'd not found out my riddle. He was a sharp fella. I think if he had been watching someone else's life, he'd have said, you're leaning... You're, if you fall, that's where it's going to be. But why couldn't he see it in his own life? Where was Eli weak? Could he have remedied this in somebody else? Well, when Hannah was there praying and he marked her lips, he went up to her and said, he thought she had been drinking too much, said, how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Oh, he could certainly see it in somebody else. I see a leaning here. You need to get this straight. But could he look in the mirror? He judged Israel 40 years. Obviously, he had a lot of experience in judging. But he didn't judge himself. Where was Saul weak? Could he have remedied this problem in somebody else? I guarantee you, you don't raise a Jonathan without some discernment. That's right. He raised one of the most noble characters in the Bible, his son. And yet he couldn't see it in himself. Where was David weak? You listen to the instructions he gave to Solomon. You listen to the message of the Psalms. He could see it in other people. He could see the needs in other people's lives. Where was Solomon weak? Could he have remedied this in someone else? All you got to do is read Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. Oh yeah, he knew the answers. Mm -hmm. He knew the answers. He could have evaluated somebody else and told them, you're leaning. You got a weak spot. But he fell. If you read 1 Kings 11, you'll find that Solomon set his son up 
Not for success, but for a fall. You understand that if I'm leaning, I'm the head of a home. Maybe, I, maybe I'm mama or papa or pastor. My leaning is going to affect my leading. Yep. Okay? David repented and he set his son up for success in many areas. But he couldn't avoid the fact that his leaning was passed on to his son. His son leaned farther and passed on a worse situation to his son. Therefore, you have multi-generational dysfunction and finally a crash. Yeah. David crashed some, but he revived. Solomon went there and he set his son up for a major crash. What was handed to you? Were you raised in a perfect home with perfect parents? Perfect church, perfect examples? Probably not. Probably not. What was handed to you is probably this or, or a worse situation. Okay? The question is, can you overcome it? Right. You can. You can overcome what was handed to you. You don't have to lean. You don't have to have weak spots. You don't have to have tendencies. You can crucify the flesh. You can put off the old man. You can put on the new man. You can walk in the light of God's Word. You can evaluate, but you've got to be totally honest right. before God. You've got to have the ability to evaluate yourself and not just everybody else. You've got to look at that poor man in the casket and realize it's you we're dealing with. And when you do that, and you get self-abandoning honesty and are willing to evaluate yourself the way you would evaluate someone else with your same leaning, and you're willing to discipline yourself with the same counsel you would give someone else with your same leaning, and you would make the prescription without covering or softening or excusing, you can overcome what was handed to you. That's right. Because you are affected by your home life, how you were raised, and the leanings of your parents. You are affected. But you can overcome those things to where you can, you can focus on, <clears throat> instead of looking at everybody else's leaning, you can focus on straightening your trunk. Right. Straightening your life. And it says here, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. What's that supposed to mean? That's Kodesh Kodesh. Yes. After the same manner also he took the cup and he had supped saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. What does that all mean? I am supposed to be partaker of the divine nature. If I am remembering the broken body and the shed blood of the perfect Lamb of God to atone for my sin, the only way, the only right attitude, the only way to do that worthily is to be determined to be totally honest to judge myself, to examine myself in light of this. To pour contempt on all my pride. To hate my selfishness. To stop excusing my flesh. To realize that's what put Jesus on the cross. Yes. That's what the body was broken for. That's what the blood was shed for. To purify and cleanse 
and make it to where I can be partaker of the divine nature and have a straight, pure, holy life in Him. And excusing myself and covering for myself in my leanings is partaking unworthily. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. The wrong approach. The wrong spirit. Not, not too casual. Not holy. Not reverent enough. Not surrendered. It says, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat. In this, and so means in this way. With this spirit. With this approach. Examining yourself. It doesn't mean examine yourself dishonestly. It doesn't mean examine yourself and cover for yourself. It means get thoroughly honest with yourself. Examine yourself in the light of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. Examine yourself in the light of God's sacrifice to save you. Examine yourself in the light of the holiness of this situation. And so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Why? That we should not be condemned with the world. Do you understand? God is determined to straighten you up. God is determined to weed out everything that is not of His divine nature. God is determined. And He's going to chasten you. When He chastens you, you will either examine yourself and straighten up, or you will be condemned with the world. This is a most holy ceremony of the New Covenant. And avoiding it is avoiding God's salvation. Yep. <clears throat> Partaking too casually is bringing down God's wrath. Right. This is a very narrow path, but it is a path to life. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a most holy ceremony, just like the Day of Atonement was to the Jews most holy. They looked upon it as... And, and Jews today look upon it as the day when God decides whether they can live another year. They repent. They, they have mourning. They have fastings. They confess sin. But God expects us to live that way. He doesn't expect us to have communion once a year or twice a year. Boy, that, that uh, gets us off the hot seat, right? Wrong. <laughs> The first Christians observed it weekly. Often. He didn't say for as seldom as you do this. He said for as often. But this was a most holy ceremony. And the very reason that 1 Corinthians 11 is written there is because he said you're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. Yeah. Now, if they didn't come together at all, they weren't doing any better. They, were supposed to, they had to come together for the right purpose, but they had to do it properly. He said, when you come together into one place, this is not the Lord's Supper. It's, you, you're missing it. You're doing it all wrong. You're eating and drinking to your own destruction. They can say, well, God should be happy that we're here at all. No, no. You can tell them that on Judgment Day. I'm not going to. Hmm. Brothers and sisters, We are far too presumptuous. Way too casual. Yeah. And someday on Judgment Day, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people terribly surprised. I don't find any options other than partaking worthily mm -hmm. if I want to go to heaven. Right. I don't see any other options in the Word. It's not just, well, I accepted Jesus a long time ago. That's all covered. Yeah, I'm taken care of. They don't even know what they're talking about when they say that. We are in a holy covenant with God. And there are holy ceremonies. And we've got to not only do them, but we've got to do them properly. 
That's New Testament Christianity. Let's stand together. If the new, if the American or modern church is casual in any area, it's in this area. Yeah. Most people today think it's wrong if you don't just let everybody come in and partake together who says they're a Christian. They don't know their Bible. They don't know their God. What we are about to partake of after we pray is Kodesh Kodesh. And partaking unworthily is no different than Usa touching the ark. Mm -hmm. It's no different than Uzziah coming in and presumptuously offering incense on the altar. We need to get a grip on the fact that just because, just because we're more sober than somebody else doesn't mean we're sober enough. Amen. Just because we're more reverent than somebody else doesn't mean we're reverent enough. Just because we go to church more than somebody else doesn't mean that we are in line for God's blessings. That's right. We need to quit comparing ourselves among ourselves and looking at what the world's doing. We need to get in the book yes. and find out what God's analysis is and what God's protocol is. Because He's the one that's going to hand out pass to heaven or pass to hell. He's the one with whom we have to do. He's the one that's going to decide where I spend eternity and what type of judgment I receive. So it really doesn't matter what everybody else thinks and what everybody else says and everybody else's opinion and everybody else's gospel. What really matters is where do I stand with God Almighty? Amen. And I've got to be willing to totally, honestly evaluate myself in light of His Word. Yes. Any thoughts from the brethren before we pray? I like that uh, picture of the tree up there. The idea of that because in many ways people, they may be leaning one way and they know they're leaning that way. They're leaning towards some worldly desire or riches or something like that because they're they're really leaning towards maybe giving a little more time than God and things. But they want a lot of times they try to add a counterweight. They try to put we'll give a big donation to some some charity. Well they start they think that just put some more branches off the other side will take care of the lean. But that ain't gonna deal with it. You gotta deal with the root. You gotta straighten it where from the in the trunk. You can't just try to to cover it up by adding something on the other side of it. We've been tapping trees. There's some really nice maple trees out there. They have a nice straight trunk, but the whole thing's leaning. Bending the trunk's not the answer. Like you said, it's foundational. Like we, just like the tower we talked about. And if the plane's destination is where the needle's pointed, apparently, we should not feel safe if we feel like we well we're not over the line this way. If we're leaning that, if we're if our needle's going to the left. We need to realize that that plane keeps on that course. Right now, it's just slightly to the left. You keep on that course, and you're going to end up doing a real big circle, and you're going to be washed out. You're never going to make it to the destination that you're looking for. Right.